Uh, so whatever exit everybody was taking to get to their to their uh, buildings, that's the ads that they, they that's what, what they saw. That's great. Uh, this is the NeoBooks call for Monday, March 25, 2024. Um, I was hoping to report in on uh, progress on an intro to NeoBooks, but I'm not really done enough to do that yet. But I that's high on my priorities list is the explainer we've been talking about. Dave, I'm curious about the rainbow and the the slightly uh, uh, Garden of Earthly Delights characters that are populating your rainbow. And I wish I could tell you more, except that I found it on the web somewhere. Oh, okay, okay. It's a web artifact. Stuart, yeah. yay. Stuart's still connecting to audio anytime now. Ready and... Oh, it's taking its own sweet time. Can you hear us, Stuart? Can you hear us yet? No. There we go. There we go. Whew. Welcome, Stuart. Good. Uh, you're muted. We're just starting up. Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> hey, nice to see you. Welcome back. back. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I was just reporting in that I'm working on a NeoBooks explainer, like what are these things and why do they matter and how does that work? But I'm not done enough yet to show it here. Uh, and my goal is to get it good enough that I can take over an OGM call uh, and make that the topic so that we can get the word out and recruit people back into here and do some more goodies along the way. Um, so that by way of just starting. And does anybody have a burning NeoBook issue that you'd like to discuss? We, I mean, I can do a report out on the things on the GRC one. Um, we had another great. Friday session uh, that I thought went pretty it's interesting. I feel like there's a, a pattern around these kind of, uh, and Stuart, you, you probably have this much better down, but anyway, a pattern around trying to get organized around stuff where the first session tends to be just like a muck. And then like slowly the second and third sessions start to get more coherent. So you have to, you know, you have to get through at least three of these before you can decide whether you're making any progress or not. But this felt fairly productive. I was just trying to see if I can share the uh, the notes document. One of the one of the things that I'm uh, excited by, and I don't know, I don't think we said this last week, is that I've been, I took the, instead of nuggets, I'm trying to get us to talk about burning embers. Um, the the idea being that we were trying to spark ideas with the stuff that we're putting together um so they're not they're not passive they're active they're you know they're there's they're on fire kind of as the notion um so you we're, we're we're trying to talk about burning i'm trying to talk about burning embers instead of nuggets but the mm -hmm. translation of the same concept um and uh let's see i'll, I'll share the uh i'll share our notes document i don't know if it's very useful or not but And yes, uh, Dave, very much so. Initial conversations are always, you know, what I'd call divergent. And in order to have some coherence and understand what you're doing, you need some convergence. Yeah, and it took, you know, it just takes a little while, I think, of people talking and maybe some listening to to kind of start to get to get some of the convergence. So it just is a patient component. As a as a brief aside, Jerry, Jose, and and Klaus, thank you for completing the agreement document for this project. <laughs> I, I'll... I I didn't fully complete it, but I started. <laughs> and I'll... we and we didn't have that conversation last week because you weren't in the call, so we were going to go back into that as well. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thanks for that update, Dave. Uh, and just how are people responding to the notion of embers and, and is it catching? Ha ha. Is it, is it catching fire? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anyone was more, you know, I was excited about it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if, any, if anybody else adopted everybody, you know, that was part of the spinning around is like people, I think everybody has their same con their own concepts that were 
um, revolving around. So there were things like, you know, there's a lot of conversation around 12 step programs and kind of, you know, trauma and interconnectedness and, you know, so motivations and, and people's kind of vision for what's possible are complicated, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. is, is, the, is the thing. Um, and I don't even think, I mean, I'm still excited about the notion that this would be something that you'd have multiple people, you'd have the core set of the fire and a whole bunch of people producing from it in various channels. I'm not positive that everybody else has bought into that idea. So, mm -hmm. or, you know, or that it's even possible to, to orchestrate, but, um, but to me, that still feels like kind of an, 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 an integral part of being meaningful is kind of somehow harnessing that abundant effort in some kind of uh, way that amplifies Cool. Um, any thoughts or questions from anybody about what Dave was just talking about? If not, I will turn our attention to the NeoBooks agreement. Yeah, I'd just like to, uh, David, respond to what you're talking about and, and what you picked up on, Jerry. And we spoke about this before. I think that, you know, people have different attachment to different metaphors, and it depends upon what they're drawn to. Um, and so within this group, Nuggets has a particular meaning, which I'm, I feel like I'm still grasping. And uh, I, I, I do like the idea of something that's more dynamic. So embers, I raised the previous one of the notion of, you know, spores and mycelium networks, something that's more dynamic. And even for me, I, I think whatever metaphor you choose, there's going to be upsides and downsides. And it's just a question of what resonates with your audience and what, what gets them going and what inspires them. Um, and I think we should look at the output rather than the metaphor. What works in one group may not work in another group. So um, whatever metaphor works, and I think actually helps to have a variety of metaphors so we don't get too locked into a particular metaphorical framework. Which is sort of what I've ended up doing because I, I love mycelium and fungal metaphors. I think they're fabulous. So I own the big fungus.org and I've been, I've got a, a bunch of pages about why mycelial metaphors are so cool, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm trying to do that at the same time as over here, I'm talking about nuggets and narratives and. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, yeah, even, even my, I still find limitations with that because uh, to me, it doesn't create, it doesn't uh, involve high level creativity. So that one can go to tapestries as a metaphor where it's not just a simple, it's, it is, you know, uh, a buy and metaphor, uh, tapestry, something that, you know, is last six centuries, you know, um, and, uh, you know, so there are upsides and downsides. So I think it's, it's a question of playing around with metaphors. Love that. Um, anyone else thoughts on this? If not, it might be useful for us to dive into the, the NeoBooks Agreement spreadsheet again and just talk it through more, uh, get re-familiarized with it, and figure out what's where. Let me um, let me move Jose's column closer to the rest of the ones that are filled in. Um, and then let's, uh, shall we just go, Stuart, do you want to walk yeah, or talk us through this? Well, <laughs> Let me just say one thing, okay? It's not meant to be a wordsmith document. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Yeah. It's, it's, it's meant to be kind of cumulative in some way um, and to um, surface where there, there are really big disconnects that we need to be concerned about, okay? So it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a working lattice work, all right? Um, as a as as an as an outcome and 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 a container for our thoughts about what it is that we're doing. So that's the intention. One, two. Um, I looked at it a couple of weeks ago, and and frankly, I'm a little still a little still quite brain dead right now mm. in terms of traveling back from um, uh, uh, from Bangkok yesterday. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to really drill down through it. I didn't That's... realize you'd just gotten back. That, yeah, that caused... yeah, yeah. Wow. I got back last night, and the first night of sleep is. Uh, hey, it, thanks for being on the call. Is diff is difficult, and I don't know. 
I've been, I've been reading, anybody read the book Parable of the Sower? I've got it on Kindle, but I've not finished reading it. Um, the you Octavia know, Butler book? Yeah. Pardon? The Octavia Butler book? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know who recommended a while ago, but it's an extraordinary uh, literary um, explication and detail of what life could be like in a dystopian environment. Mm -hmm. I wish it on no one, but it it's it's pretty it's pretty riveting. And the interesting thing, it was written about um, it was it was written in. Um, I'm looking for the. The date is 1993. Yeah, thank you. And the projected dates of when the dystopian landscape were right around where we are right now. Damn it. So that's the good news, I think, that 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 we're not there. But it's a it's really a quite a riveting, a riveting read. Anyway, um that has got my brain a, a little a little crazed also. I was reading it as, as I couldn't quite sleep last night. Mm -hmm. all, of just, us are, all of us are old enough to have lived through 1984 and 2001 and all these mile, <laughs> milestone years that were going to change everything, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she actually so, picks uh, 2024 as the actual year yeah. of, of the instability. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. When thing, That's when things totally fall apart. Oh, great. <laughs> We're still early in the year here, Stuart. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Only month, only month three. Thanks Not for that month. thought, Dave. <laughs> and, and Stuart, one, one of the ways I impressed April when I first met her is that I had just the night before landed on my first trip to Seoul, South Korea. And I started telling stories about my trip to Seoul, you know, over coffee with her and Kevin Kevin Jones. So yep. she was like, well, oh. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just have to say one thing about the trip. And I spent two weeks in China, a week in, in um a week in um uh Guangzhou and a week in Shanghai. And uh and I'm going back in a month to spend some time in Taipei and, and Beijing. Wow. Um yeah. Um I really didn't think deeply about expectations of what I would find there but I was just walking around in some ways agape and of course I was in mostly higher end um, parts of the city which is pretty extensive I mean China um, there's a little darkness in the the felt sense of what the place is like um, but it's also orderly and it works and it's a huge consumerist society. Unbelievable, the level of, of high-end malls, but also the quality of the roadways, the cleanliness of the streets. Um, it's just something to think about when we think about um, governance. And I, I know you've been having these governance calls, um, um, Jerry. And the same thing was true with, with, um, with Guangzhou. Um, so... Uh, and then I, you know, drove home from the airport last night, or was 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 driving home last night, and 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 the level of shakiness of the roads because they're in such disrepair was just unbelievable by contrast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, when all the autonomous vehicle stuff uh, popped up a couple of years ago and got hot, I was like. China not going to have trouble with autonomous vehicles because the roads are clean and they, whatever. You go down a country to India, and you you have shacks on the side of the freeway and like kids urinating on the sidewalk because that's what they do, uh, and it's like so entirely different. You do not want to be in an autonomous vehicle in India, kind of any place. I don't think for a long time. <laughs> well, you know, also notice just noticing the you know the freeways aside from the positive condition of them, um, they are filled with probably, I would say 70, 75% electric vehicles um, and mostly all late models. And, and the idea of the US EV um, marketplace, you know, that China is gonna eat their lunch is the common parlance. Uh, yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Driving in many of the, these cars in the equivalent of um, uh, of Uber 
called, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was a grab, um, the service in, 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 in China. Um, they have, you know, fine vehicles. So interesting time ahead. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to take us through talking through the Neobook Agreement? Do you want to lead that? Um, sure. Okay. In a way that works for you? Yeah. Um, my brain's not really right. Okay. I don't have, yeah. the, I don't have the horsepower to do it, Jerry. I'm, I'm... So, sounds great. Let me, let me just give it a go and then we can, you can correct us as we, uh, uh, as we come back and, uh, figure things out. Let me move Rick closer to the crowd. Whoops. There we go. Rick, I'm going to move you in closer so we see what you're writing as you're writing it, as we go. Excellent. And Dave, uh, oh, good. You're doing the same thing. Fabulous. So uh, at the beginning, we just had, uh, there's this broader topic of intent and vision. And I tried to be really, really short in mine. And mine's still the longest one, but uh, and then breaks down into roles, uh, promises, and so forth. And I, I, I like the categories. I, I found myself easily able to address them. And I was, I was sort of hoping to create like the baseline narrative that we would then um, uh, riff on together as we um, figure stuff out. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, and Jerry, what I what I can say is that I, I think that the intent and vision here is probably the most important piece mm -hmm. for where we are right now, just to get some, you know, clarity of, of, of just what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. And so in the middle of my paragraph, it's like nug more, uh, our social interactions around nuggets might improve thinking and discourse affecting how we share and improve ideas. Is is I think maybe the core of what I'm trying to what I'm trying to communicate is that is that this is not about publishing books. Uh, this is really about uh, liberating ideas and helping I helping us share ideas. And the ideas don't have to be facts. Um, they can be opinions, and uh, they can be crazy ass opinions. That's fine. But when they start to get organized up into uh, nuggets or embers. And we start to be able to compare and contrast them and tell stories around them. I think that's where it gets really interesting. Um, and then a lot of us in the description talked about the poly crisis or the different uh, you know crises that are going on. Um, let's see, who want who would like to jump in and just describe your own opinion on this or how it how, respond to other people's um, inputs on intent. And vision. Let's just stick with that for a second. I have two reactions, and I think uh, I, I I've just looked at it, and I, I'm thinking at two levels. One at a meta level, what's the meta level across things versus the particular things we're interested in, um, and I think that might be worthwhile separating out. Um, because to me, working at the meta level is much more in terms of what is the commonalities across uh, what different people's domains of interests are, um, and what are the the what are the um, meta features and benefits of neo books, um, and what are the outputs. And one idea that uh, I've been I, I I sort of had in the back of my brain, I brought it forward and articulated it, and that is. You know, I was thinking about neo books, but I was I was then thinking about collab books, which means um, is a little different, maybe different. I don't know, but the idea is a, a, a neo book is never done; it's always being evolving, iterative, and whatever. Um, and um, the reason why I say collab is because in, in my in, in one of my blog posts, I I, I said I, I'm going to invite people now. It's very difficult to initiate change in behaviors on, uh, you know, LinkedIn or any platform because people get stuck in a modus operandi, and it's a real transition to go from con pushing content, say from a marketing and messaging perspective, which has its value, which is not what I'm interested in as much. It's important, but I'm actually more interested in how can you get people to think differently. Now you need both. 
but actually I'm more interested in the latter than the former. So I'd be interested in what people's uh, uh, ricochet reactions are to what I just said and if it made any sense to people. Uh, yeah, I'll focus on, on the last statement you made, Rick, about you know getting people to think differently. Um, though the marketing it isn't isn't important, the articulation of uh, ideas in a clear way um, as a, oh, yeah. as a, as a template to generate different thinking, I think that's um, that's very important. So in some sense, um, there is an advocacy piece. And, and I, I also had this thought that we need to be very careful. I love the idea of some of the neo books having opinions, but I think that you know, uh, in contrast to a lot of journalism, we need to distinguish opinions from facts, <laughs> whatever that is. Sorry, um, I don't know how often we have pure facts anywhere. Like yeah. <laughs> news is supposed to be news is supposed to be objective, just the facts, but it's yes. always always shot through with opinions, right? So yeah. I don't know that we have an interesting manuscript that is merely facts without opinions. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, I, 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 if anybody else thinks you can separate them cleanly, let me know. Like, say so now. Uh, and and Jose, I know that you have a great interest in having foundational facts and and building up from there arguments so that they they can be credible and comparable. I'm probably putting words in your mouth, but I think you of, of all of us here, you you may have the strongest feeling about uh, facts in that sense. But I, I'm. Good. Could, could I just res quickly respond to Stuart because he responded to me? Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's both and. But I think the emphasis is much more on content creation. Creating a, It's about telling people what to think. So I'm interesting, more interested in not only uh, helping people to think, but to think about how they think, metacognition. Um, so it's definitely both and. You can't have that without the former. But I think so much of what we deal with is uh, telling people what to think. It's just, it's content creation. It's not a uh, process co-creation. Rick, is the metacognition need to be explicit or can that just be part of the no, work? No, no, it can be. No, I, I don't think it should be. Okay. I think, you know, yeah, no, definitely. You don't even have to use the word. Good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just using, there is a word for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, to answer your question, Jerry, I, I think... The word facts in of itself is a problem, right? But um, the the idea that uh, there are understandings that we have and that to the best of our knowledge, those understandings um, seem to, to reflect the reality, though they don't always stand the test of time and that's fine. But if we actually have this idea that um, that understandings don't mean solid, forever fixed things, that our job is to actually improve our understandings and that those understandings should be looked at from a first principles perspective rather than just sort of in, in the ether. Here's an understanding and I believe this thing. Okay, well, how does that relate to other understandings that allow for that to be... Um, for us to be able to to judge whether it has um, a relationship to other understandings that have been over time stood the test of time. So so to me, the idea that we're not talking about facts, because as you point out, facts, uh, first of all, most of the time we don't talk about facts. I don't think that's what humans were built to do. We, we just talk about concepts. Um, and whatever those concepts are, for some of us, those concepts relate to reality and others don't <laughs> sometimes. Um, so so I, I don't think it's that issue. I, I think the issue for, for me is that the way we hold these understandings is loosely and that the way we talk about things isn't about as absolutes, uh, but as ways that have relationships to other understandings that you can't say, I, I love 
the fact that uh, you know the rainbow has green and pink. I'm not sure where that rainbow has green and pink, but that the rainbow has the older spectrum rainbows of are much simpler apparently. <laughs> uh, that they have the spectrum of colors, and then say, well, green and pink is one of them. You know, um, we know that that's not true because we have this understanding of the spectrum of colors. That's reasonable way to look at things, right? Um, and so for us to be able to not leave things in the in this space where we can't argue uh, understanding through a, so through some level of logic and through some level of experience, I think is essential. Okay. And, and Klaus, for you, for example, there's a bunch of assertions about the small water cycle, the large water cycle, soil fertility. I mean, there's a, a bunch of, of stuff that you sometimes need to teach people um, because they just don't understand the effects of policy on all those different kinds of things or how there might be new measures that are more fruitful and certainly how there are new industrial sort of paradigms that would be more, you know, better for the earth. Um, so I think that the facts basis is not that hard for you to jump on and, and think about, right? No, and, and I was just uh, thinking about you know, facts and visions of the futures and so on. Um, <clears throat> the, the reason why the dawn of everything resonated so much with us, right, is because it, uh, it, it, it sort of provided statistical probability of things happening depending on. Maybe you can compare it to smoking. You know, if, if you smoke, you have a statistical uh, chance of contracting cancer. That's pretty darn high, but it's not absolute. A lot of people smoke and you know, are doing just fine. You know? you know, think of George Burns, right? Until the age of 100, smoking, puffing on his cigars. But you know, by and large, you're taking on risk. And so there are certain behaviors that societies and civilizations uh, and, and, and people take that increases their risk of uh, damaging their their well-being and the i think the, what i was really wanting to get into is that um, we have lost our relationship to the natural world we have lost our relationship to the biosphere and i'm trying to explain this as technical as necessary but not more necessary not more than necessary so for example the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle, is actually turned out to be amazingly important because most of the climate models ignored it or missed it uh, and, and uh, didn't incorporate how incredibly uh, damaging or, or how, how uh, the, the water cycle being changed accelerates the impact of climate change. So now that's really coming out. And Guess what? The the hydrologic cycle is rooted in soil, and when you damage the soil, it has so many things uh, that are going wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of I'm trying to connect, you know, past this future. I th I don't think you can look at the future without understanding the past, um, and, and 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 that's why I started, you know, basically with the dawn of everything in the first new book. Uh, and and incorporated uh, uh, behavioral issues in in the way we think and 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 yeah go ahead and very briefly um, just before Stuart just because it fits really well well here your your mention of the dawn of everything reminds me of a different thing that I think we're trying to fight or clarify which is aphorisms that are being used as if they were facts like when people say life was just nasty brutish and short before. And it wasn't. And it wasn't, right? It, no, it, it actually wasn't. But that's used as an assertion, as if it's everybody knows that, this thing. But it's just a freaking uh, aphorism, and it's wrong, right? It's it's wrong entirely. Sorry, Stuart, back to you. No, that's okay. No, what, what I was going to say is I would imagine that most of the pieces, most of the neo-books are going to involve um, painting with a broad brush um, here's what we've been doing, folks. <laughs> here's he, here's the here's where it's going to head if we keep doing it, and here's a different way of both thinking and acting, and here's a sense of how outcomes for the 
biosphere and all the people on it, all the humans on it and, and other animals on it could be better, um, whatever that means, if we if we follow a different line of thinking. Now, within what realms and in what way? Because I've, I've, uh, there's a couple articles that have happened just recently about the pandemic and lessons from the pandemic. And most of them say something like, well, experts are really mixed about what strategy was the best strategy to pursue as a national policy during the pandemic. And outcomes are kind of mixed. And we are now no better prepared for a pandemic than we were before this thing struck, except that we have mRNA vaccines, which by the way, a whole bunch of people refuse to touch because mRNA, it's crazy science stuff. And it's Bill Gates trying to inject chips into us so he can you know, do mind control. And I'm, I'm like, I, and climate change feels to me like a much larger, thornier problem than a pandemic. So how do we hope to make our way through the thicket of facts and assertions and interactions? That's a good. That's a good uh, question, Jerry. I think in terms of um, uh, our quote editorial policy, whatever whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. There's an article I'll post in the chat from Tom Nichols titled "When Experts Fail." which is part of where I'm getting the uh, that thread about the pandemic and us not understanding it well. Um, so despite the fact that I believe that, that these things are so messy that sometimes we will have a really hard time figuring things out, I think, and, and, and this is, I'm going to jump through a couple of different hoops here. I think people respond to stories and they respond to emotions a lot. And it turns out that emotional stories are carrying the day right now. And it's a problem because some of the stories that are emotional are completely, completely bald faced lies wrapped up in some kind of story that has attached itself to a bunch of populations and is driving the political agenda as we live and breathe right now. I think part of what we're trying to do is intercept that and modify it or, or affect it in some way so that people uh, perform better metacognition, stop listening to crazy stories and start finding reasonable stories. But I think the antidote to crazy ass stories might, might in fact be other stories that appeal to emotion as well. I don't think the antidote is, hey, here's a perfectly logical set of facts lined up so well that you can't refute them. I don't think that actually works. And I don't mean that nobody should write factual books anymore. I just mean that the the dynamics that we're that I think all of us are interested in intercepting and, and shaping and affecting have to do also with stories. And how do you tell a compelling story? And a story is a, a blend of anecdotes and opinions with a couple of facts sprinkled around. And if the facts pointed to obliquely by the story are supportable by your worldview. And Jose, I'm thinking about here, like what, what's this resting on and how solid is it? Then awesome. And sometimes the stories, nah, they, they're an act of faith. They're, they're, they're parables, not, you know, parables sort of intentionally loosen you up from the world of science and facts uh, in order to prove something else. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to make room for more of how large scale social contagion happens, how large scale decisions happen so that we can still have a, that big effect. Because I feel like if we limit ourselves to rational structures of facts, we're going to be talking to uh, you know a couple dozen academics. Yeah, and, and feel free to disagree with me. I disagree. No, I... Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I actually do agree with you, um, because in some ways um, I think I think what we want in terms of impact is to have some of these ideas or you know some of the ideas and ways of thinking go viral. Bingo. Mm -hmm. That's the real you know potential magic mm -hmm, of progressive thinkers. You know. Um, but are you talking about the virality of? Um of a neo book or the virality of neo books and the viral and the virality of behavioral change as a result of the, the neo books 
So I think all of those things is what we're what we're looking for. We want to we want to have some impact. That's why we're that's why we're doing it. Right, but I would I would question the that if if what we're saying is what's going to change things is doing more of the same then we're going to do more of the same and more of the same will continue to happen if what we're changing is doing something different then hopefully that something different will find its own niche in its own way of resonating and for me that that that's what i thought neo books was so my focus isn't on old people like us, right? What we've got is a new generation. My stepdaughters as an example, my nephews and nieces as an example in their 20s who are like, this is all fucked. Yeah. Some of them are into drugs. Some of them are just working their ass off thinking that if they can work their ass off, something better will come of it. But for the most part, nothing is changing for them. And they're, they're seeing that they don't see a road at the end of this. Yeah. Right? So yeah, for exactly. me, how do we speak to them in a way that's different? And these young people, in my opinion, and this is an opinion, not a fact, recognize that they don't... Um, that they that the way we've been doing it doesn't work and that it's not simply that we have a new narrative but that the new narrative that we bring has a different way of being delivered in a different way of being engaged with and and so for me that that's what i think is interesting about neo books it's not just that yes we need new narratives fine agree with that but we need to deliver those new narratives in a form that is so unique and so different and so open that in and of itself, whatever the narrative is, carries with it the value of the delivery mechanism. And I'll shut up at this point. Um, I'll say thank you. That actually, I think you answered a piece of the question that I immediately wanted to jump in with, which is, um, what, which I just wrote in the chat. Like I thought you were going to say what we need to change is this this rely over reliance on narratives and stories, and we should go to logic. That's not what you're saying. I don't think. I think you're saying that the act of interacting with a story or a narrative or a fact should change. And if we affect that, we can change the quality of discourse and metacognition. And that should be pretty contagious. that like like, and I'm completely That's right. I'm completely on board with that. That makes me very happy to hear. Because I, I think a big piece of what Neobooks is meant to do, it's about idea sex. Th this is about how we, we come up with and compare ideas and change our minds about ideas and then turn other people on to better ideas and whatever else. And, and, and how does that actually happen in the world? So I, I, I love that. And correct me if I'm uh, going in a direction you didn't don't agree with. No, I, th I think you're I think that is it. But it's the important part, I think, is back to to, to the holding of uh, of these um, ideas as things that everybody can play with, and that as an <clears throat> author, I don't get to put a whole bunch of ideas out there and say, "Too bad, so sad. This is my idea, and you're screwed." Mm -hmm. Right? It's hey, this is an idea. Let's let's all have a chance to play with his ideas because kids today, from what I perceive, they're fed up with this person's the expert. Oh. They're, yeah. they're, they're over and done with all that shit. Yeah. Yeah. I just came back from a, I, I'm sorry to jump in. Um, uh, it was a, a conference of um, teachers in um, international schools in Asia and I couldn't agree with you um, more in terms of, you know, teaching methodology K through 12. Um, just the, the idea of the expert standing in front of the room is just kind of gone. Mm -hmm. mm. Thanks, Stuart. I'm close. Yeah.
Yeah, the, the reason why I introduced spiral dynamics into the discussion is because there is no such thing as one story that tells for, that, that that works for everybody. So I had uh, I had a meeting last week with a group of evangelicals who started the meeting by challenging me with a short video from uh, um, uh, some some uh, guru. Uh, that summarized how electric cars, such as total nonsense, and why this doesn't work, and put out all the, the data points of how much of our energy is being generated between coal, oil, and gas, and what it would take to electrify uh, the industry. So I started out by saying, yeah, I totally agree. It's not, there are not enough minerals in the ground to build enough batteries to power the entire uh, fleet. It's just not going to work. Besides, we're learning uh, things about batteries being sensitive to heat and cold in ways that diminish mm -hmm. capacity right. and so on and so on. But then I proceeded to say, now let's take a look at how God created this world. He, he put carbon into this world, real carbon. And then the way he's using this carbon is that some of it needs to be in the atmosphere because there it plays the role of regulating the temperature inside the atmosphere. And the rest he put into the ground and where it became coal, oil, and gas because it, he, he didn't need that, that carbon in the atmosphere. Then what we have done is we are now digging up trillions of, the, of this, so, so you understand where I'm going. Mm -hmm. It was God, right? And we are interfering with God's creation. Now, I had another meeting there's a group of orange folks, you know, business people and so on. And there, you know, you're talking about the incentive structures in the economy that are misallocated, that are causing farmers to do things against their better knowing. And that is damaging and destroying, you know, their soil and the environment and the water tables and so on. So that same story, you know, has to be, has to be uh, placed into the context of your audience. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm 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 trying to write it. In fact, you know, I'm you know I'm using AI for 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 writing my stuff, and the 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 attempt is to go beige to 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 yellow on uh, on writing so that it is broadly understood. It's generic enough uh, to not to not uh, create any absolutes for any for any worldview where they they uh, exit. So, so the 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 message, um, whatever you're trying to explain and bring across to your audience, uh, really has to start with who you're talking with. When you said orange people, I started thinking of uh, Mr. Trump. I, I didn't know uh, exactly who you were talking about there. Yeah, Trump is actually red. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm no, 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 he's thinking about his hairdo, not not yeah, his hairdo, not 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 yeah, his, no, his, not his, his, his complexion and his hair. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but Trump is actually in the red spectrum, you no, know, and MAGA followers are in the red spectrum, which makes it so very dangerous. You know? I have a huge collection of nicknames for Trump, and uh, the orange cyst of misogyny, the orange god king. The orange Julius Caesar and the orange faced Fuhrer are several of them that do uh, use orange. There's also the giant orange Twitter egg. I guess <laughs> that, that's from before Elon taking over Twitter. Oh. Now, Elon is quite orange, right? He's a perfect example of, of orange where uh, completely materialistic, you know, completely uh, uh, return to heaven. There's a couple more oranges. The orange overlord of absurdities and the sneering orange man-child. People have been very creative. <laughs> and I, I did not make, uh, and then you can get close to orange, Mad, the mad tangerine colored commissar is one of them too. So these are all actually quotes from someone somewhere deciding to needle Trump. Look what that got us. Um, so what the, where does this take us with regard to the agreement and what we've said on the agreement? Has what we've just talked about elaborated on our definition in the working document? 
I've added things in it. I, I, I felt there were some things where I felt the categories didn't quite fit and I put some words in there. But actually, I wanted to pick up on a point that uh, Jose was talking about earlier about uh, the younger generation. And uh, I just want to share some very brief family stories. Um, one of which was um, I'm involved in another group where there's somebody there who heads up an organization called Filmio. And Filmio is an organization that is a counterculture revolution to Hollywood. It's trying to get a platform creators together where they can crowdsource funding, collaborate, and come up with things that are more relevant than what our um, cultural hegemony of Hollywood and China and Bollywood and whatever does to us. Um, and um, it so happens my, um, my nephew is... Uh, He's, he's half English, half Indian, and he's at Bristol um, University. And he's at film school. And he sent me something um, about his little video clip that he did as a school project. And I thought this was brilliant. I mean, it was really good. It's got a great talking voice, his video. And anyway, after that, he sent me a, a crowdfunding thing. He needed 1,500 pounds for his group of students to actually um, do this project. And it, I think it's a great idea as a, you know, get some money to be able to do your, you know, that's what, you know, films have to do. So anyway, I sent a, 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 a note to um, the CEO of this organization. And I said, have you thought about connecting up with film schools globally and creating and doing exactly what he's doing, but within Filmio? Um, and he was very, he was very taken by the idea. And he said, you know, well, maybe you should, you know, speak to your nephew and see if you'd like to have a Zoom conversation with the students. And I thought, wow, this is great. Well, then I sent some more ideas back to him. So that's just a, an, a, you know, an example of a, of a catalyst. And then the other one was um, I was uh, watching, um, I can't remember where it was. And anyway, it was Yuval Noah Harari who's come out with his second book um, about Unstoppable, Unstoppable Us. And he, I, I didn't realize it was a two-part book. Anyway, I decided to get them for my grandson. Um, and uh, it, it so happens it's my 71st birthday today, and I today? said I would give him today. No way. And, you, tell, you took this yeah. long to tell us? <laughs> anyway, so I said I would give I, – I don't accept presents anymore. I, I say you can take me out to meals, whatever, but I don't want presents. But I said I'll give you a present on my birthday. So he's coming over. At, uh, I have to pick him up from uh, the bus stop, and we'll come home and start reading this book. Um, but the, the point of the stories actually is to tap into the intergenerational aspects of, uh, of, of these books that, you know, similar to what, you know, class was talking about, we have to think about sort of generational or, you know, emotional development, intellectual development, moral development about what's appropriate different ages. And I have no idea how he's going to take this book, but I thought I would sit down and start reading with it. It may be just a little ahead of his reading age, uh, but we'll, I'll find out at 415 today so um may I inspire all the grandfathers and fathers here is to think about how you can actually inspire the younger generation with some hope and i think that's what neo books have to do if it doesn't if it if it does by the way i went to see john Baptiste on friday night unbelievable experience unbelievable the guy i, I just went on vacation in new orleans and had a week down there with my my, my sibs and came back and watched that and having watched him his performance because i've been to orleans it gave me a much better feel for his music and he's got so many virtuous songs freedom joy whatever and he's he's just a he's just a musical savant i mean he's just unbelievable anyway that is my we i mean what i'm trying to convey is the spirit of what i'm saying is something that needs to be in these books it has to be uplifting it has to be something that people are attracted to because they don't want to put up with this shit anymore. I'm Rick and I'm done speaking. That's great. I, I, um, if I were you, I would check YouTube to see who's written a short review of Unstoppable Us because he would likely have watched that. The, the shortcut is go, go find somebody intelligent who wrote a, a summary or gives you an opinion about this long book you're probably never going to make it through. Uh, you just muted yourself back then. Oh, yeah. It, it's not too bad, actually. And he's a avid reader. He loves books. He goes to the library and gets 20 books out at a time. Damn. I mean, he's just, yeah. I mean, he's, he, I just, I, I say, no, you've got enough. Oh, no, no, I want to take more books. I want to take more books. 
So he, he's a he's a he's a bookworm. So maybe he will get through it. We'll find out. Anyway. Thanks. I just did a quick uh, YouTube search. Yeah. Um, so Jerry, in, in response to your question, um, I think the conversation has expanded, clarified. Um, you know, a couple of great ideas have 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 come up from the from the dialogue to me. You know, that the books need to be you know inspirational. They need to be forward thinking. They need to be um, multi generational. Um, um yeah mm -hmm. um and they need to change minds mm -hmm. that's what that's what i that's what i i heard and that's a great in terms of you know editorial policy and they also need to be open-ended mm -hmm. um yeah and, and and now that i'm talking i just wanted to um acknowledge um Klaus, and I, I actually, I didn't cite you by name because nobody would have known who you are, but I actually talked about the, the methodology of using AI to focus on um, constructing um, advocacy for different audiences of important ideas and um, kind of a meta-educator um, saluted that. As a as a as a methodology and a way to use um, AI. Cool. Um, so, do we want to update the text in the spreadsheet, or we just want to have walk through these conversations? I don't think the spreadsheet is something we're working on as a leave behind document that needs to be correct or that we need to all agree on i think it's 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 sparking the conversations we need to have i agree that's the that's the that's the intention cool mm -hmm. uh shall we shift to roles or are we done with i don't, I don't know that we're done with intent and vision but i um I just push back a little bit on, on what Stuart just said uh i think the books obviously what we want is is books or material out there that it does help us to change things. But I think the only way we do it uh, differently is through a different way of, of seeing neo books itself. In other words, it's the old thing, right? You can't change something by doing the same old thing, right? Part of what I think is important, what really excited me about the idea of neobooks isn't that we're going to write a whole bunch of different books uh, that are better, which I hope we do, but that there is a an idea that the book as it was isn't serving us anymore. And so that to me whatever we serve up on that platter is going to be different, even if it it speaks in the same way that the traditional book did. If it's served up on a neobooks platter, then I think it's serve, we're serving something different. And, and so that's my trying to really not focus so much on what we create, but on how it's created and what it is not not just the content of the stuff but that that content is different in how we it's perceived by the the audience and by us yeah. right so, yeah so great so i have a my reaction to that jose is and it, it, it it's important um in some ways just calling it a, a a book even though it's a neo book but just using the word book it's a loaded word, and and maybe we need to have a better term. I agree with that. Well, so the neo books is a, is bait. It's um, basically it's a decoy. The book part of neo books is a decoy because it gives us a starting place, just like Wikipedia is an encyclopedia. 
And everybody's like, oh, 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 okay, I know what an encyclopedia is. So they show up and they expect an encyclopedia. And so one aspect, one facet of what neobooks sh should deliver is something that looks and smells and talks like a book, except the much more interesting, vital, alive, connected, useful thing is in the networked, connected, alive, living embers, nuggets, whatever, that the, that compose the neobook and other neobooks that are woven through it. And at some point you lose the need to be manifesting any of this stuff as a book. And you're just in the mycelial web of ideas and arguments, um, basically living in there in some way. And, and Jose, I think probably I've limited my imaginative thinking about what the next more exciting thing could look like by focusing on how do we get a damned book out of this that looks like a book. And I think that's probably influenced my not going full bore. And I'm curious whether you've had any visions, even in your dreams, of what that environment could look like and smell like. Because the closest I get to it, I think these days is, hey, a nugget or an ember has a, in its orbits a bunch of manifestations of that idea that's in that nugget some of which are animations in video and they're really cool, but now I'm trapped in YouTube, but at least I've got something more interesting than a block of text in a, in a Kindle book, right? Okay. But what, what else could this be? How else does this get more exciting? How does it become the all singing, all dancing possibility of the future? I think that's a lovely question to ask. And I, I'm wondering who has good answers for that. And I don't think we're talking about, exploratory fiction platforms. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're talking about three-dimensional cartoons, but I'm not sure what it is we're talking about at that frontier. I, I like that frontier a lot. I'm curious what's out there. For me, so, it's... Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, just to expand a little bit on what Jerry said. Um, I think we need to produce a few of them. And to see to, and to have those examples of what they are um, as emergent phenomenon, um, right. rather than try to define it um, going in. Well, for I me, think you might do. Go ahead. I was just going to say that for me, the 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 vision that that's slowly been building for me is the blend of Wikipedia. Uh, a kind of book idea, but but not really book, and Instagram. That instead of the Instagram posts, that it's the nuggets. And that the nuggets are part of a big combination of nuggets. I'm using your terminology, Jerry, here. Thanks. But but that that these pieces stand alone, they can be uh, seen and interacted with as videos, as text, as images, as whatever. That when you click on it, you don't just like it; you can actually go and en engage with it and go yeah, deep exactly. into it, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that it's um, that. The the idea that we're talking about something that has a beginning and an end for kids, I think, is gone. I think it's just bits and pieces that resonate today and don't resonate tomorrow, and something else will resonate the day after, and them being able to engage and be a part of it. And right now, the way that they're doing it is they'll they'll take something on Instagram and then they'll add their view to it on top of it. And and add their words to it, add their music to it, add their text to it. How do we create an environment where we're actually having not just memes that are fun and cute and all of that stuff, but memes that actually have understanding behind them? And and I don't think we can <clears throat> buck the trend of what's happening in social media. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we actually have to buy into that. So when when the words that we're talking about, you know, um, that this has got to be in a wiki, I think that's wrong, personally. <clears throat> that this has to be in a 
uh, and an environment that feels like Wikipedia, I think that's that that's just the opposite of where we need to be going. But that we need to offer those things in this new in this new world in this new lens. Mm -hmm. In other words, the only reason to bring in Wikipedia into this isn't to make it look like a Wikipedia, but to have the functionality of wikis within this type of platform. So to me, we're talking about a brand new platform. We're not talking about making do with the pieces we already have that are old school pieces. And to, to what Klaus has said before, it needs to be something that I log on and is exciting. Here's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of these right. memes happening. Yeah. Here's, here's, it's not, yeah, it's part of a narrative. It's part of a book, but I could consume them one by one by one. And it could be that three of my nuggets from my book are in the first 10. And then the next three of somebody else's and the next three of somebody else's. And I can engage with the one that I want. And I want to follow that, that narrative. Let me follow that narrative. I want to see that narrative. And let me engage with that narrative. That's that's what I'm seeing, Jerry. Thank you very much. Um, Klaus, thanks, thanks. That was really useful. Yeah, I think that's pretty much where we left off in the last meeting. Um, the the I, I think we have sort of exhausted um, the conversation about wiki books, what wiki books are and what they could be and what they're not. Um, and because we, we keep you know going around, but the question is, what are we going to do with them? I mean, we have some examples, and we talked about uh, using a platform, right? Uh, uh, compartmentalizing new books by topic, whichever way that works best. Keep providing an introduction website and uh, a side introductory uh, note of what what we are trying to accomplish here, what this is, and then you have a side for new books and let people play with it. Let them challenge the assumptions made in the book. Let them talk about it. You know, provide exactly. a discussion forum on it. Um, and I, I, I mean, I just think we're more than ready to to proceed with that and uh, and uh, and get going, right? Because um, I mean, I'm I'm plodding along. I, I just uh, got my next topic for uh, for the next nugget for my new book lined up, right? And 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 the 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 way I'm writing the neo book is um, following along the the route that uh, sort of the consensus opinion as I pick it up on LinkedIn and other uh, chat rooms and so on as the conversation advances, you know, and mm -hmm. topics that come up, I write another nugget, and then I put it in, you know. But I think we're we're really we're really overdue. To, to launch this thing and and maybe have a conversation about how best to do this. How are we going to go about the design of this platform? Uh, uh, write an introduction to it and so on. Now, um, before moving on to Stuart and Jose for a second, um, Rich Burden, who has invented a platform, uh, joined us for Free Jerry's Brain a couple of weeks ago and demoed his platform for us. It's new, it's not out in the world yet, so he didn't want us to record the thing, so I have no recording of that call, unfortunately. But it was a platform that smells like Google <clears throat> Workspace. It has lots of different apps that, that are as polished as Google uh, Docs and, and so forth, but then you can basically load different apps into that space. <clears throat> there could be a whole ecosystem of apps, and then he showed us an app that was just a chess game where you, you could you know interactively move move pieces and it would move on however many connected desktops were looking at that particular chess game because he had built multi-site sort of sync into the platform, et cetera, et cetera. The, the good thing about it is that it looked very normal to somebody who's used to using Google Workspace. The bad thing about it is it's brand new. And then uh, uh, one of the very, very technical people on the call had an, uh, an issue with uh, sort of URLs in it, which are sort of internal and not external. And for that, philosophically, he was like, nope, nope, doesn't work for me. And I was like, hey, this actually looks like a really smooth, wonderful platform. We might be able to use this. So anyway, there's some things on offer that are just part of our networks of networks because I've known Rich Burden for a long time. Uh, Pete Kaminsky used to work with Rich Burden at one of Rich's startups long ago. And Rich was strangely the CTO of the brain for a year in the brain's early, early, early going in the very late 90s. 
Um, <clears throat> so any, any um, and I didn't meet him until much later than that, but but it's it's an interesting alternative. Now we go to Stuart and Rick. You're muted. I think we're at a perfect um, segue into talking about roles because if we're going to if we're going to actually produce something, um, who's gonna who's gonna do what? Who's gonna take responsibility for what in terms of getting getting particular um, functionality done so that we can produce a product? Mm -hmm. Sounds great. If I could just elaborate on that a little bit in terms of how to do it, as as you were, as, you know, the word book was questioned. I thought it was a good question to question about the book, but it, actually, what it did made me think about is the issue of neo, because um, you know, to me, what came to mind was netbooks uh, rather than neo books, because a netbook is something is networking. So. You know, I think framing and marketing is critically important. I don't know if there's a, a substitute word for book. I mean, net collab doesn't convey the book idea. So I wouldn't, you know, uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's just a question of how you reframe it. And, um, and this is just top of my reaction, so it needs more thought. But um, the idea of a net book, to me, conveys some of that aspect. And what Jose was talking about earlier is, you know, we're never going to find the perfect platform, and and we're going to be we're we're going to be victims of whatever platforms are out there. So, Rod, how can we co-op current social media platforms more effectively to be able to do this? Whether it's LinkedIn or whatever platform people are on, so you have to go where the people are because you're not going to draw them to a new platform, or if you are, you're going to have to have some huge amount of funding to pull it off. Um, but I actually, it's funny because I when I, I just put the filmio link in there, and I just thought of, okay, what happens if you were to combine this with a film, you know, a documentary that there is a theme of, and then you, you have a Neo book that sets it up. Then you do the movie and you then do a Neo book that's ongoing based upon the impact of the movie. And, uh, you know, I think we just have to think in different, uh, I mean, th that idea just came to me from what I just shared. But thinking about how to link into different media in order to be able to draw an audience. So um, I don't know what people's reactions are to the netbook idea, opposed to a neo book <clears throat> idea. Um, netbook is a branded, trademarked, up and down. Like you can go buy a Google powered netbook. Um, there's tons okay. of them in the marketplace. The, the 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 term is actually rigidly in use right now in the marketplace. I'm not sure. Okay. I like I like your well, idea uh, about net connections a lot. I just don't think that we can use that term and make. That's fine. That's fine. But it, it's that. it's more the idea uh, of the prefacing because to me, neo just means new book, uh, to me, um, and collab book or something that um, you know gets across the idea that you're having an you're having a learning community around it. Uh, so, my personal history around this is that really quite often. I've written about the future very with some clarity. I'd never invented the thing that became commonplace, but I actually have a thought in my brain I'll share with you guys of, of stories that I, because I've been thinking about this as I'm trying to tell my own story better, but I have often described a thing that shows up a few years later. Um, so I wrote an issue mm -hmm. of the of Esther's newsletter called What's a Zine? And I borrowed the word zine from short, small circulation, hand, hand Xeroxed, staple, you know, uh, personal newsletters that people did. But in the issue, what's a zine? I describe weblogs. And like three, four years later, weblogs show up and take off and eat the world. And mm -hmm. I've done and, and I've done that bunch of that a bunch of different times. I never picked the right name. But if we sit here and worry yeah. about the names and argue about them and go back to that every time we have a call, we're never going to actually get the work done. So if I may just run the table as project lead and say, can we just call them neo books? Can we call them nuggets for a bit? And can we move through this thing to the point where we realize, oh shit, we should never have called them nuggets. We need to call them Frenestance <laughs> adapters later down the road. And I have a side project I mentioned earlier in this call called thebigfungus.org. And maybe we call them hyphae because the little growth edges of, of mycelial networks are called hyphae. And isn't that cool? But a couple of other people have used hyphae for their project names because they love the metaphor. And I love the metaphor. 
<clears throat> so I, I don't really want to get hung up on our, in our and, and on a lot of OGM projects, we've gotten hung up on terminology. I tried, uh, you know, early in OGM, I tried to have us or, organized into guilds and go on quests. That did not sell. Um, and well, it's, I, it's a great organizing principle because it gives you stuff that you can animate and connect to it. Well, I, I hear your frustration, Jerry, and I'm quite happy to move on into the role aspect of it. And one of the things about the role aspect of it is what can we do? Uh, for example, uh, Klaus, you seem to be taking lead with your new book, and I, I, I made some comments uh, on one of them. But actually having much more concerted effort in the co-creation of the new book that if you if we if we decide to use LinkedIn, for example, that we all commit ourselves instead of having conversations just here, that if you have elements of your book that you're writing, and a way of getting peer review and reactions to it is that we all commit in our roles to make a point of commenting and commenting on each other, and inviting the community to do the same. I don't know whether that would be helpful for you, Klaus, or whether it's going to be a complete distraction. But well, it, anyway. It's it's helpful to me because my professional network resides on LinkedIn. That may not be true, you know, for what Jose is doing. Uh, and, and then maybe Facebook is a better option here or whatever, right? But, well, uh, we all agree, whatever platform people prefer to be on, that if you're taking the lead, you're on LinkedIn, let's all commit ourselves. You let us know. Uh, and actually, from what I understand from the algorithms, if you can actually release it, and everyone starts commenting on it, it helps to promote the thing. Now, whether that's still true sure. or not, but within a couple of hours, if you if you release it, your Thursday meeting, for example, where there are more people, and you say, everyone, go there after this call. This is this is what it looks like, and then get everyone to go and write comments on it. So no, this is all good. But I would still like for OGM to have a platform that we can lead back to. Oh, you know, that's fine. Still, oh, yeah. Because yeah I, it's I, both ends. Uh, both ends. Both ends. Yeah. But I'm just saying this is part of the writing process. So that, you know, one of the things is that, you know, uh, you know, you know, I'm involved in writing products with different academics and, you know, it's it's all messy and whatever. But, you know, the more input and, and if you have that co-creative process as the part of building up to it, then, um, you know, that's what I love. I, I mean, I love, I just got some feedback from an article I sent to somebody and they sent me, and it was great. And they even used AI to give some more ideas about my writing, which I thought was was uh, interesting, so. Uh, so a couple, of, uh, just a moment, Stuart, just for a sec. Um, we have currently, there is an OGM group on LinkedIn. We just don't use it at all for conversation. So, but it, it exists. I created it so that OGM could look like an organization. We could go in there and start talking about the Neobooks project and that would be, completely legit and really cool. We also, Pete and I created a sub stack for Neobooks with the explicit in, in, intention of using something as popular as Substack to try out nuggets that we've each written. So Klaus, I think part of the, the, the proposal to you was take pieces of what things that you would normally write on a blog post or put wherever else, put them through Substack. Um, we will then create a nugget for that particular piece of writing and put it on the web presence uh, so that people can come back and find it. Because the part that's thorny is that we haven't figured out a good way to interact with nuggets yet. Um, I, we tried to have that conversation here. That kind of that kind of didn't work very well. But people can rate comments on Substack posts. That's you know so co-opting existing social media would work really well. And we've got a bunch of things that we're good at. And once we we've tried once we've floated one piece through that process, we can go back to OGM and say, Hey OGMers, uh, please go on LinkedIn, like this, comment on it. Uh, go to the Substack, subscribe to the Substack, send us in your contributions if you want, join us in this effort, and here's where and how it works. And we can do that with existing stuff like LinkedIn and Substack uh, without worrying about writing new code or doing whatever else. And that, that's at hand right now. Is good? All right. Stuart, thanks for being patient. Yeah, no, no worry. So um, I'm just going to throw out some thoughts about what we need to actually um, get into production um, in terms of people taking responsibility for certain things. Um, just my ideas. So we need um, editorial, obviously, in some ways. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that means. That's for up to us to come up with a policy, but we need somebody who, you know, to take a look at, at stuff. 
We need something to do with technology. Um, we need something to do with uh, um, delivery, marketing, distribution, PR. I, I've lumped all those things together, getting stuff out there. Um, and I don't know, the, the thought about um, just process, um, a process person for um, how we how we do that. So those are those are my thoughts to get us moving into um, productivity. So we had a we had a, a, a Neil books call a couple months ago, I think it might have been in your middle of your travels where we kind of updated on all of this. And I was like, hey, <clears throat> Peter and I talked about this and the, the, the gaping hole right now is editorial. Like, like it takes actual editors and a bunch of time to turn a manuscript into a finished book looking book. So we were trying to hack our way through that. And we realized that unlike a small press that would have editors on hand, Neo, Neo Books doesn't have the wherewithal to do that. And we sort of said, we need to source that some other way. And there's lots of you know useful ways of doing that, including just somebody hiring an editor if they want to. Um, we, Pete and I are kind of the technology uh, pair, I, I can't code to save my life, but he can. And we've been trying to help improve the platform, the the, wiki, the massive wiki platform so that it can sing and dance and do some of these things. I think that a lot of the things we wish we had or could do are in, within the vision and scope of, of Pete and massive wiki. The problem is very little of that code has been written yet. And the process of asking for and getting uh, pieces of it written is really kind of slow and, and it isn't necessarily working that well. Marketing and distribution, we're going to need, and we've done a little bit of thinking about, but not a ton. But the moment we have a, an artifact we want to propel into the world, there's a lot of help on that. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff we could do that are quick wins. I'm not I'm not as concerned about marketing and distribution. And then I'm trying to document some of this process on the wiki pages that I'm writing. Uh, I'm probably the only one doing that at this point, but I'd like to do more of it and have other people collaborate on that as well, so that if somebody joins up and says, "Gosh," This Neobooks thing sounds cool. What is it? Boom, go here for the Neobooks intro stuff. Okay, great. I'd like to I'd like to write one or I'd like to improve other people's Neobooks. How do I do that? Okay, boom, go here. Okay, good. I'd like to create one. How do I do that? Okay, start here. And each of those is a narrative trail of nuggets that are connected up into uh, answering each of those questions. That's great, Jerry. Thank you. I mean, that's that's really good. So there's a lot of there's a lot of it, pieces that that are in place. Um, as you talk, I think about the word editorial and you talked about it being you know a little bit challenging. There are two aspects of that I think that are important. One, um, what's our editorial policy? I think it's very congruent with the intent and vision we have, but it's important to have you know some degree of, of, of amorphous clarity around that <laughs> oxymoronic as that may seem. Um, um, but also the process of, you know, how stuff gets, you know, looked at, um, reviewed in, 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 in some ways. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know if I, if I'm, um, Pollyannish around this, but for some reason, I don't see editorial as a big, as a big problem. Um, from your lips to God's ears, Stuart. <laughs> maybe maybe it's because per, just personally, I'm a, a a reasonably quick study um, in content. Um, I know, and it's really interesting. You know, somebody asked Jennifer to write a blurb for a you know a, a book that they were working on, and she was kind of struggling with it and needing to drill down into all the detail of a book. And I've been writing blurbs for quite some time. And it's just like a, a, a simple no-brainer for me to, to do that and do it quickly. Um, yeah. I would just say like, honey, fan through the book, wave it over some food <laughs> and a candle, put it up against your forehead, and then write whatever comes. <laughs> um, Dave, I... I, I'm trying. I, I think I need more time to think about your question in the chat. I think there is a there's a there's a social dynamics that's like Wikipedia but different, which is about the the community part of NeoBooks and the living document part of it. There's a channels out into the world as medium Substack or also YouTube channels, other sorts of things aspect to it, which is how does this stuff find people who need to use it. 
Uh, and then there's something else that's better, richer, more interesting than those things that is part of the conversation that Jose was bringing into, into our call here, uh, which is how do we go beyond and make this like a vital, attractive, exciting thing to be part of so that it feels like community when you're in it, uh, doing the Neo books thing, which shall be renamed in the future. Does that help a bit, Dave? Yeah, I think I was trying to, I was like, because I, I feel like uh, I think I've been thinking of the Neo books kind of as a, as a model or like almost like a protocol or something. It's like a set of ideas I would like to try to use kind of, but at some of this conversation was like, it's more like a destination where kind of a knowledge is growing and, and being aggregated and growing, which was the wicked, you know, like a Wikipedia age thing, you know? And so I that was a little bit, I was like, do we want, is it, is the destination important or is that a byproduct of the, of having the other stuff? I don't know. Something like that. I think, think of it as a journey, not a destination. I, I think I, I mean, destination, like a, a website that's, yeah, yeah. you know, got, got traffic. I think what Tosh was asking for earlier, we do need, which is like, hey, this Neobooks project sounds like a fun thing. Where do I go to learn more? And that needs to be a URL that people can reliably go to and we'll keep getting you know, more information. But I don't think that that becomes the hub of all Neobooks. I think Neobooks are a set of protocols and concepts, more like the first thing you talked about. And that hopefully the, the reason we're using stupid things like Markdown and GitHub is that that opens up collaboration big time because those are very simple tools anybody can connect up with. And it, it's a very simple structure protocol and you're off to the races as soon as you get engagement. But because we're trying to figure out all these things at once, we don't have engagement because we don't have a thing out the door. So the, the quicker we get something out the door with a placeholder website that says, hey, here's where you learn more and what you do, uh, the better. Yeah, I, I think there's two audiences here. One is the, the 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 reader, the people who just want to participate, versus the um, content and process co-creators. I I would like to be on a wiki with the co-creators, the co you know the people who are actually interested in doing the work, and then there's the people who want to engage in the work. And I think it, it, it's important to have different strategies for those two two categories. So, agreed and. Part of what we're trying to do is attract some of the passive readers to be community. Um, exactly. Which exactly. Is, which is a piece exactly. of what Wikipedia does, strangely enough, because Wikipedia is like just this big encyclopedia that billions of people go and use all the time. And then they were like, oh, wait a minute. There's an edit this page button on here. What's that? And once they figure out that it exactly. might work, a few exactly. of them, a few of them join the community. Not a lot, exactly. but, but when yeah. a few of a whole bunch of, when you have a huge bunch of traffic and a couple of those people join the community, that's super fruitful. That's really, yeah, I love exactly. that dynamic. All right, go yeah. ahead, Jose. I was just going to agree with what Rick said, uh, though I didn't know if he was going to say that. Um, but um, But I also think that making that split between what we the protocol that we're building defining uh which we really haven't talked about um and the fact that that protocol could live anywhere in social media and have the means to identify that protocol anywhere so that if if anything that we publish, LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever, has been part of this protocol, then there's this ability to get back to this central place that, that says, here's what the protocol is about. Uh, here's how it works. Here's who's who, who can use it. And if you'd like to engage, come on in. Um, so I, I'm liking more and more the idea that there is a central repository from a protocol perspective and not a so centralized use of that protocol in different places. Thanks. Stuart. Yeah. So I feel a little bit like tit for tat. Earlier in the call, Jose pushed back on me, so I'll push back on, on, <laughs> on him now. And that is, you know, um, you said protocol, which we haven't talked about, um, unquote. I think we've talked about it quite a bit. 
um, you know, we haven't named it as protocol, but I think we've talked about it a lot in terms of just what it is that we're that we're doing and what we want to do and 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 how we're going to do it. Um, I think for me, there's a difference between, and maybe all along that's been true. Uh, so I may be wrong, but um, there's a difference between talking about a product and a protocol. To me, the idea of a protocol is a set of standards that you could build your own product out of. And, and it doesn't have to be centralized. Here's the protocol. Are you working with the protocol? I can go up and stand up my own use of NeoBooks using the protocol and I, and I do it and that's all. That to me is sounding more interesting than a centralized set of tools that everybody kind of has to use uh, whereas the protocol is, here, here's what a NeoBook looks like. As long as it does A, B, C, D, it's a NeoBook. It's interoperable. It works. It it has these features, all of that kind of stuff. If we were to talk about that, then we wouldn't be talking about what tool constitutes the protocol. Okay. Now, I, I, I get that. <clears throat> and the thing that just pops up is, as important is... Um some editorial quote policy um, around content, mm -hmm. it, you know, and, 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 and what my concern around that is, is, um, you know, I go back to, um, to the statement that Schmachtenberger made at one point in time that there, there will always be um, people um, outside of, of the edges of any initiative that are going to subvert it in some ways. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, Good bail. We have uh, run through our time. This has been really useful. Um, more soon. I think I have, I have, Lots my my, my question, ones. one last question for Klaus: yes, How can we help? How can we help you? We don't have to ask, uh, respond to it here now, but I just feel like you know part of this role is if you're if you're if you're the spearhead, so to speak, on an initiative. How can we help you? I have a meeting with Pete on Thursday to uh, to uh, see how we can do the integration with AI. What are the options here? Uh, but okay. I'm also using it professionally. Um, uh, we we would like to uh, to integrate AI in the services that we offer to farmers and to Mitch is starting to work with a farm group in the Palouse um, and to others because it is just incredibly powful. You know when you uh, it is you right get this. exactly. And so, other than that, the way you can help me is to get this thing going. You know? so, <laughs> well, well, I, I, I would say that I would say the same thing with the body of content that I'm that I'm I'm, I'm working on. Also, let's let's get this going and and figure out the emergence. I, I also wanted to make one other comment on the agreement piece. Um, we're 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 hitting the high points. I think many of the other elements in it. Um, just need to be punctuated in a in a in a, in a quick way. I, I think we've done the hard, the more difficult heavy lifting at this point in time in terms of creating a, a container for what it is we're up to. Cool. cool. Uh, one last question for Klaus before we take off. Um, Klaus, are you more interested now in a chat interface to your the body of work you're writing than a an ebook? Um. I think we need to combine this. Uh, the the oh, I mean, um, you mean when you say ebook, you mean uh, uh, Ma neo making making a Kindle book version of your of your manuscript. Yes. Oh through, no, through I'm, the far more interested, I'm far more interested in getting a uh, an AI interface because I think that the way that that uh, AI is evolving now, you know, this latest uh, uh, I attended a. Uh, a presentation by Sam Altman. I mean, didn't attend. I mean, I watched the video from from a Sam Altman discussion. The way he is proceeding is uh, could maybe best be described as radical decentralization. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, so he he is really uh, allowing this whole thing to fall apart into pieces and see who picks up what. 
And uh, as it turns out, the, um, the, the quality of this AI comp uh, comp uh, depends entirely on the way it has been trained mm -hmm. and the credibility of the individuals training it. Um, and in order to maintain the integrity of that, you need to have a user interface. So that's what I'm basically discussing with Pete is to create a user interface. Then you encourage discussions, right? And then as you are encouraging discussions, uh, you're trained, you're further training the AI because if people raise legitimate concerns or, mm -hmm. or point out gaps, the AI will pick up on it in advance. You know? So so that's why I think uh, the Neo book, uh, bringing people to it and having them engage with it, asking questions or making statements, challenging the assumptions is the most powerful thing we can do to, to create a common understanding of what is real. You know? What is our closest, best available understanding of reality is what I'm after. Um, do you mind uh, checking in with us at the start of next Monday's Neobooks call on, on how that conversation goes and where you end up? And Pete might be on, on that call with us, but I'd love to start there. That'd be great. Sure. Terrific. Thank you all. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. More soon. Good to see you again, Stuart. Great to see you. Bye now. Thanks.